So for a few moments this morning, we're going to be looking at having the right perspective. Do you have the right perspective? Do you have the right perspective about life? In other words, do you rightly value things? Do you value those things uh, that you ought to be valuing? And do you disvalue those things that God would say to you that should be disvalued? And how do you make your decisions? Uh, how do you know what God would have you to do and what God would not have you to do? How is it that you come about the choices that you make in life? All of these are so very, very important. And I believe that our text addresses these for us this morning. I'm going to begin, begin reading to you from Luke, the second chapter, beginning in verse 25, down through verse 35. What an amazing man we have before us uh, in the person of Simeon. Simeon was a was obviously an older man at the time of the birth of Jesus. And he was there in Jerusalem, a very devout man. And it says this, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. Looking forward to Israel's consolation. That word consolation there uh, implies the saving work of God. God's redemption. God's salvation. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ or the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. And when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, of course, brought in the child Jesus to perform for him uh, what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God you know, this was not, this certainly was not a little whisper. And here's Simeon in this public place, and he is blessing God. He is worshiping. He's praising God. He recognizes the, the seriousness of this moment and the beauty of this moment, the magnificence of this moment. And he just, just burst into a time of praise of the Lord. And it's a time of prayer. And he just blocks out all the audience that might be observing him. And he says this to God, now master, now Lord, now kudios, you can dismiss your slave. Look how he refers to himself as a servant of God. You can dismiss your slave in peace. What's he talking about? He's saying, all right, I can die now. I can die now. It's all right with me. Because how can life get any better? Life just can't get any better than my looking at the very Christ. My holding in my hands, my very Savior. How, how can this be taught? So God, now, I, I've climbed to the, to the very top of the mountain, and I'm ready now for you just to take me on in to heaven. You can dismiss your slave in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. And then he refers to Jesus here as the Savior. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. Isn't it wonderful how this Jewish man is recognizing based on Old Testament prophecy like Isaiah chapter 61. That this consolation of Israel is the Savior of the world the Savior of Jew and Gentile, and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him, and Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, indeed this child is destined to cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And so he says, along with this glorious, wonderful news, you need to understand that this baby is going to be rejected. And, and this child is going to be uh, the pain about, for a lot of people as he's the judge of all of the world. And a sword will pierce your own soul. No doubt she felt that sword at the time that she stood there at the foot of the cross as Jesus was, was agonizing in his execution there. The sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Oh, this Jesus who would die and be resurrected from the grave would be the judge of everyone. And every stone is, is overturned in the hearts by Jesus Christ. 
And he's the one who judges not the action, but the very thoughts and the intent of every body. Listen, to be successful in any area, we're talking about in business, in relationships, uh, in athletics, in any area of your life. In order for you to be successful, there has to be some understanding. Uh, you have to understand objectives. You've got to know what you're all about. You've got to know what your goal is. You must know what your purpose is. And you also have to have the understanding of, of strategy. How are you going to achieve that goal? What, what does this process look like as you are going after what you are convinced would be success in this area? That's true of all areas of life. And I tell you, it is especially true of the things in the Spirit of God. If you and I are going to be successful as followers of the Lord Jesus, if we're going to be effective in God's kingdom work, if we're going to realize the purpose for which God has saved us, we must have the right perspective. We must have spiritual perspective. We must have biblical perspective. And does Simeon not have that perspective here? You see, Simeon saw something when he looked at baby Jesus that obviously nobody else saw. His heart was inclined to truth in a way that, that certainly the vast majority of people's hearts were not inclined in that context. And there was just something going on in the life of Simeon in relationship to this baby Jesus that others were totally oblivious to. Now, I must grant to you that, that God will sometimes speak in the context of devout godly people into the heart of an individual and show them something that maybe others do not see. But I tell you, Simeon here was rightly positioned spiritually so that he could receive from God what God wanted to tell him. And you and I will not have spiritual wisdom. We will not be uh, candidates to hear from God in our life. We will not be able to know the heart and the mind of God that must govern our day-by-day -day living and, and guide us in the decision-making process that we, that we are engaged in daily. We will not be able to do that if we do not meet those spiritual qualifications that are exemplified in Simeon so that Simeon could really hear from God. Now, somebody would say, well, all you need to do to hear from God is you just spend a lot of time in the Bible. And I, I give that to you that certainly you're not going to hear from God if you're not in the Word of God. The Bible is foundational to the entirety of our Christian experience. And we, we will not hear from God if we do not spend time in the Word of God. But I want to remind you that there is an individual who knows the Bible far better than I will ever know in this world. And he's going to burn forever in the lake of fire. Just knowing the Bible does not put you in a spiritual position. You know, just having the ability to, to, uh, to lay out, to outline and, and expound upon systematic theology. To know with precision uh, Bible chronology with all of the different events and all of the personalities in the Bible. To have all those facts. Yes, that can be greatly beneficial to you in hearing from God. And you will not hear from God apart from a heart that is, that is one with a great appetite for the Word of God and pursuing the knowledge of the Word of God. But it's more than just knowledge. It's more than just having the facts. Notice with me here as I take you through the text, as we look at the example of, of Simeon, that he was a man who knew practical righteousness. Practical righteousness. You're not going to get God's perspective about things if you are not living that life that honors the Lord. God's not interested in giving you spiritual insight if you're living in disobedience to Him. The only insight that He wants to give you is the insight that you need to repent. That's where he's going to be with you. 
But if you're living a life of dedication and you're being obedient to the Lord and you're seeking to follow the, the guidelines of Scripture, then God will be able and He will desire to do so when your heart can be receptive uh, to the truth. Verse 25, notice what it said there. There are two words I want to zero in on. It says that uh, Simeon, this man, was righteous and devout. The kindness is the word that's translated righteous there. And the Bible dictionaries tell us that it means to be equitable in character and in action. It implies innocence. It speaks of being holy. It speaks of purity in one's life. And yes, we, we have positional righteousness, positional dikaios before God because of our faith in the Lord Jesus. The Bible teaches us that we all still sin, but God sees us, all of us who have our faith in Christ as our Savior Lord, He sees that the imputed righteousness of Jesus covers us. And when God looks at you, He looks at one who is covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of Jesus has been placed upon you. God made Him to be sent for us, this one who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 that God has made us acceptable unto Himself in the beloved one. And so the reason that God receives me is that He receives me in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not my performance but it's the, the righteousness of Jesus that gives me position before God. But as one who has a righteous position before God, I am now to do as Simeon, and I am to live righteously. My lifestyle is to demonstrate a right relationship with God. My life now is to be given to reflecting the heart and the character and the purity of God. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 that the Lord has redeemed us unto Himself. He has paid that ransom price to make us His own people. He's redeemed us unto Himself that we would live soberly. That means to live circumspectly. It means to live with a, with a spiritual understanding and, and a uh, heart that is alert to God. Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so I'm not just being righteous in position, but righteous in position should always be demonstrated in a right practice. And the testimony of Simeon was that he lived righteously, which means that he turned from sin, he repented of sin, he rejected sin, and he embraced all of those things that he knew God would have him to have in his life. Connected with that, it could be a separate point, but I want to tie them together and it's that, that next word there. This man was righteous and devout. The chaos, righteous, devout, eulabase, eulabase. It, it, it literally means to be religious and, and pious. One of my study helps, the Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, puts it like this in reference to this word that is translated devout. It says it means to, to be careful as to the realization of the presence and claims of God. Oh, now get that. Get that. To be devout means that you live with a careful realization. You are protecting your consciousness of the presence of God. To be devout means that you know moment by moment that God is with you. And that God is watching you. And then God is listening to your thoughts. All of this is a part of the fear of God. The right fear of God. We live with a consciousness of, of God. That means, that's what it takes. That's, that's foundational to be being devout. A realization of the presence and the claims of God. What God expects. We live with a consciousness of the expectations of God. What God requires of us. So we know He's with us. We know that we can't go anywhere and get away from Him. And hang right here's one who doesn't want to get away from God. But we could not if we wanted to. 
And God sees everything, knows all things. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He never misses one thing about us at all. And when you are devout, you live with a consciousness of the, of the presence of God and you live with a consciousness of the claims of God. Simeon was able to be sensitive to the Lord in his life and to have God's perspective because he was righteous and he was devout. Righteous and devout. And then next, I want to point out to you that Simeon was a man of great faith. A man of great faith. He lived with a, with a practical, dynamic faith. Verse 25, looking forward to Israel's consolation. He had an expectation. He knew that the Savior was coming. He lived every day. No doubt, got up in the morning. Could this be the day? Could this be the day that the Messiah will be seen? Is this going to be the day? God promised me that I would get to see the Christ. Could this be the day? Don't you know that every day as he made his way into the temple and he would look around about him, he'd look at baby after baby after baby after baby, waiting on the Spirit of God to say, that's him. And he lived with that faith. He lived with that great expectation. And you and I, if we're going to really be open and receptive to hearing from God, we must expect to hear from God. We must live with an anticipation that God is at work. We live with confidence knowing that God, who has begun a good work in us, is going to continue to do it. That He will not leave us and He will not forsake us. That He sticks close to us. We live like that in faith. In verse 32 of this passage, he says here not only uh, the consolation of Israel, but he says in verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. He says this, this Messiah that I've been longing for and looking for, hey, he's the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of the world. And so great great faith. And then remember, God, Master, He calls Him here in, the, in this text. Your servant now can depart in peace. You can let me die. I've held my Savior. And listen, you and I will be able to say, I can die because my Savior has held me. I, 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 I can do now, God. Uh, he's not one of these who's going to kick and scream and cry because God's getting ready to take him home. This is real faith. He has a loose hold in this life. And he knows that, that this is nothing. And that heaven and the glory of God is everything. And oh, how he longs forward and looks forward to that glorious day of being there in heaven. I appreciate so much Pastor Scott who leads us in singing this song from time to time, Keith Getty's song, In Christ Alone. I, when I read this about what Simeon was saying, I thought, oh, how fitting. But Simeon could say, oh, I, God, I'm ready to die. Just, just, just let me come on to heaven now. I've seen Jesus. And Keith Getty writes, no guilt in life, not because we're sinless, but because we know we're covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. I don't go through this life alone. Jesus has got me. That's faith. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand until he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. And then one more thought. You and I are going to have the perspective God would have us to have. We, we must be God's righteous people. If we're going to have the perspective that God would have us to have so that we can live a successful life and see things the way they ought to be seen and value uh, things the way they ought to be valued, then, then thirdly, we notice the way he was spiritually dominated by the Spirit of God. In verse 25, Notice, and the Holy Spirit was on him. 
The Holy Spirit was on him. Verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And then verse 27, guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. Now that's, you know, that's unnerving to some people. That the Holy Spirit would communicate. That the Holy Spirit would lead. The Holy Spirit would guide. But I tell you, that's the biblical norm. Our problem is that, that Christianity, apostate Christianity, is subnormal. Non-biblical. We are being led by the Spirit of God. We're, we're not to try, we, we must be cautious and careful uh, to, to not think that every thought that we think or every prompting that we have is by the Spirit of God. We are to examine everything according to Scripture. But oh, God leads His people. God's hand guides His people. And God does speak to us in a myriad of ways to make sure we know that we're on the right track. There are things that you're just not going to read in the Bible and, and, and find your answer for. But as you stay in the Word of God and as you pray, God will speak to your heart. And God will give you that guidance. The Holy Spirit is God. And Simon, uh, Simeon rather, lived with his heart and mind fixed on God and tuned to God's voice. He lived with communion with the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God was communicating to him. I think of, of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 13, where he gave that great benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So that tells me that that's to be normal for us as God's people, that we know the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God makes himself known to us, and we walk in the blessing and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Under his guidance, under his rule. I guess the really good news in all of this is that you and I can have a genuine closeness with God. We can really know the Lord in a personal way. God doesn't just relate to us corporately, He doesn't just relate to a church, but God relates to us as individuals. And as God related to Simeon, God wants you to have that kind of relationship also. Yes. It's available to you. If you will be righteous, as one who has been saved, as one whose faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will obey the Lord, if you will pursue the knowledge of and application of God's Word, if you will be a person of faith, I will trust God. I will not be distracted. I will not fear, but I will keep my confidence in God. And if you will yield yourself to the controlling influence and the work of the Holy Spirit, you'll find yourself one led by the Lord. And God will be able to give you that perspective and understanding that you need so that you can live nothing less than the life that God would have you to live.